we've been looking at, if you could please keep quiet. If you could please keep quiet. Linda has taught me how to say, at least she's written it down for me, how to say please keep quiet in this composer. It's quite long, and she's advised me to practice it quite a lot before I try it on you. Um, because otherwise you'll just laugh at me. So, um, but watch this space. Soon, soon, I will amaze you with my multilingualism. I'm not a language person. When I came to university, I didn't study language. I studied maths, applied maths, physics, and statistics. Not a lot of language in there. Um, but I'm, I'm working at it. Okay, so... Three dimensions. So we've been looking, so first of all, questions 9, 10, and 11, all about points. So expressing a point in different coordinate systems. And then 12, 13, 14, and 15, in fact, are all to do with two-dimensional regions and expressing, uh, if you could please see it, expressing a two-dimensional region in polar coordinates. And um, what we're going to move on to now is describing three-dimensional regions in... Uh, either cylindrical or spherical coordinates. Okay, once again, uh, we'll do a lot of this later in order to find limits of integration for, in, in the case of three-dimensional regions for triple integrals or potentially, s no, no, triple integrals, definitely triple integrals. Okay, all right, so um, just a, a line of text. Um, we can describe 2D regions in polar coordinates we can describe 3D regions in cylindrical or spherical coordinates One of the skills that you will slowly develop in this course is to have a region described to you, generally in words. It's like a region inside the hemisphere and outside the cone or uh, in the first octant or whatever. And to be able to look at that region and go, hmm, this region would be best described using whatever coordinate systems, whether it's rectangular or cylindrical or spherical. And you, you will... You, you need to, and I would say, I'll say you will, develop the skill of being able to look at a region and just be able to tell from its shape and to tell from the equations of the surfaces that describe it what the best coordinate system it is to describe it. I prefer that you didn't play with your phones while we're having a lecture. It would be very nice if your phone wrote your exam for you, but it, it won't. Phones are doing amazing things nowadays, but they're not writing multivariable calculus exams yet. Um, or maybe they are. <coughs> maybe they are. You can get an app for pretty much anything, can't you? Write my multivariable calculus exam. Download. <laughs> That'd be nice. Um, all right. So there's not much to talk about except to actually demonstrate with an example. So I'm going to do number 16. It says, describe the region within the sphere such and such and above the plane Z equals 1 in spherical coordinates and in cylindrical coordinates. So let me just write down that sphere equation, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 2z. Okay, now we know that your general sphere equation, your sort of vanilla sphere equation is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared. Does so that, that mean that r squared equals 2z? No, it doesn't. It means we need to complete the square. This is clearly a sphere that has been shifted off the origin. So we need to find where the center of that sphere is, and we need to find out what its radius is. And we're going to do that by completing the square. So that's x squared plus y squared plus... Okay, I'm going to bring that 2z over, so it's going to, going to become z squared minus 2z. So that's going to be z minus 1 squared. Okay. If I square that out, I'm going to get a z squared, great, I'm going to get a minus 2z, lovely, but I'm also going to get a plus 1, so I balance it out by putting a 1 on that side. Okay, completing the square. You learned that back when, back when in your youth, <coughs> before you'd even heard of calculus. Okay, 
So this is a sphere that has a center at zero, <coughs> zero, 001 and it has a radius of 1. Okay, so if we draw it as a sphere, something like that, we'd have the z-axis here, here's y, here's x, there's the center of my sphere. And because it's been shifted one unit up, and because its radius is one, it means the sphere passes through the origin. Oh, uh, let me, not exactly backtrack, but let me emphasize something that I don't think I have emphasized yet. Again, people who are repeating the course will have heard me say this many, many times, but it really bears repeating. Even in the final exam last semester, after lots of emphasis, people were making the same mistake. Surfaces. Surfaces are thin. Surfaces are not solid things. Surfaces are thin. They're like eggshell. They're thin like paper. Okay? Even the ones that are closed. So spheres, when you talk about a sphere, you're not talking about a solid sphere. You're talking about a balloon and just the plastic, the rubber part of the balloon, not the air inside. Okay? So spheres are thin. They are thin things. You can, you know, you can think of them as being like one molecule thick. Those are surfaces. So everything that's in that big box thing on page 17 and 18, that table of surfaces, those are thin. They are not solid. They are not solid. They are not solid. They are not solid. And the reason why I'm emphasizing that over and over and over and over again is that later on in this course, you'll do something called surface integrals. Surface integrals are done on surfaces, those things there, those things that are in the table on page 17 and 18. You do triple integrals on three-dimensional regions, on solids, things that are like blocks of woods or lumps of putty, okay, that solid things, things that have volume, things that are not just surfaces. If in an exam, now when you'll discover this when we do surface integrals, surface integrals are fairly complicated calculations, and when you do them, we're looking for very specific things. We're looking to see, can you project a surface onto a coordinate plane? And then can you describe that region onto the, on the coordinate plane? There's, you have to do something that we call the conversion factor or the scaling factor. Can you, and then we want to know, can you work that out? Do you know how to work that out? Do you know where to put it in the integral? And all of those skills that you use, all of those techniques that you use in a surface integral, you just don't use in a triple integral. A triple integral is a completely different animal. So if you get a question that has a sphere in it, and you look at it and go, oh, sphere, that's kind of like an orange, kind of like a snooker ball, and you do a triple integral on it, you will get a zero for like an eight mark question. Because there's, there's nothing we can do. The, the best intentioned marker, marking your paper, thinking, can't I give this person one mark somewhere, you're going to get nothing, zero. So recognize surfaces as surfaces. Don't mistake surfaces as solids. Because that mistake, while it might seem like a trivial one, can lose you a lot of marks in a test or an exam. There was a surface integral question at the end of, in, in the final exam this last semester. Third of the class thought it was a triple integral. Zero. And it's, it's very upsetting for all involved. Probably more upsetting for the person writing than for the person marking, but also upsetting for the person marking. So surfaces are thin. Thin, 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 thin like eggshell. If it's a solid, it won't say sphere. It'll say the region bounded by the sphere or the solid inside the sphere. It'll, it'll, it'll talk about the, the, what's inside. It'll talk about bounded by or inside or above or something like that. Okay, all right. So those things are surfaces, even the ones that are closed. And in fact, the one in the exam wasn't even a closed surface, it was a cylinder. But So when a cylinder is like, a, is like the cardboard tube that's inside a toilet roll, it's, it's, it's hollow. Cylinders are hollow. But lots of people doing the question in the exam thought it was you know, like a tube of pricks, something solid. It's not solid. A cylinder is hollow. Spheres are hollow. Paraboloids are hollow. Okay. I will keep repeating that over and over and over and over and over again. And the sad thing is, is that Someone is going to get it wrong in the exam and do a triple integral instead of a surface integral. <sighs> Maybe not. Because this is the semester we're going to have 100% pass rate, isn't it? That's right. So, yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So, there we go. Back to our sphere over here. So, here we have a sphere, our nice hollow sphere. 
which is passing through the origin because it's radius 1 and it's centered at 0, 0, 1. Right, so back to the question. The question says, describe the region within the sphere and above the plane z equals 1. So, of course, the plane z equals 1 is going to be sitting over here. Okay, something like that. There's the plane z equals 1. Um, and we need to describe the region above it. So it's, a, so it's, it's, it's this sort of region in there. Now, that's a three-dimensional picture, which is all very well. But even when I'm doing something 3D, I rather like, particularly when it's something that I know is symmetric all the way around, um, I actually, what I tend <coughs> to do is I tend to actually draw a two-dimensional picture. Where here's my z-axis going up, and this is my xy plane sticking out of the page. And that plane z equals 1 will look like the line z equals 1 because I'm looking at it from the side. And this is the region that I'm actually interested in. So let's have a look. That's a 1. That'll be a 2. Um, more. All right. So now that's my z axis. Let me draw some stuff in, on bla in black there. Okay. So I'm going to draw a ray once again. But remember, that's not r now. That's rho. Okay. 90 degrees in the same place, it's still angle on diameter, but we don't have a theta in this picture, we have a phi. Where is theta? Theta is sticking out of the page. Because here's my xy plane sticking out of the page. R is on that xy plane, and so is theta. Okay? So R and theta you cannot see in this picture. They're kind of there, but you can't see them because they're on the xy plane, and so we can't see them because we're not, we're looking at an edge on, as it were. Okay? Um, there's some other pictures I want to draw. If I project this region, this um, this uh, uh, solid hemisphere, that the region bounded by, well, basically exactly what it says there, the region that's within the sphere but above the plane. If I project that region onto the xy plane, why am I projecting it onto the xy plane? Because I'm going to need that for my r and my theta. If I project it onto uh, the x y the x y plane. I'm going to get so that's x, that's y, um, that's going to be one. Okay. So that's kind of the shadow that that the, our three dimensional region that we're interested in. This sort of shadow that it's casting down on the x y plane is the picture that I've just drawn. Whereas this other one that I've drawn the black details onto, that's a, a sideways view. Okay, you happy with those pictures? That makes sense. Yeah, they're very important pictures because it's from those pictures. Stop it with the wireless network. I know you're connected. Go away. You don't have to keep telling me. Um, all right, so now let's describe it. Now that we've got all the pictures, let's start describing the region. Okay, so... Let's go for cylindrical coordinates first. Why cylindrical first? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I just chose cylindrical first. In fact, in the question, they mentioned spherical first. Whatever. So cylindrical is interested in R and theta and Z. Okay, so R goes from what to what? That R and theta you read entirely of the XY picture. So R is simply between 0 and 1. There's no funny sine thetas or cosec thetas or anything going on there. Because if I draw a ray out from my origin, it's going to be the same length no matter where I draw it. Because the circle that's in the xy picture, not the other one, but in the xy picture, that circle is centered on the origin, and r and radius are going to be synonymous. Okay, and theta goes all the way around. Theta often does. Theta element, or theta going from 0 to 2 pi, is a, you're going to write 100 times in this course. Okay, and then Z. Z goes from what to what? Well, let's look at that, that picture that's got the black detail on it. Z, Z measures from the x-y plane vertically upwards parallel to the z-axis. Okay? Now, my region only starts quite high up already. The, the region, there is no region down at the x-y plane. So, if I'm measuring Z, Z equal to zero, there's no region. Z equals a quarter, Z equals a half, Z equals three quarters, there's no region. The region only starts at Z equals one. And it starts at Z equals one all over. Okay? So my lower limit of Z is one. 
no matter what. But my upper limit of z, what is that? I can't say 2. So I'm going to write 2 here, but it's wrong. So don't copy it down, okay? It's wrong. And I'm going to rub it out. It's tempting to write z goes from 1 to 2. But if we wrote z goes from 1 to 2, what we're describing is this. We're describing the entire region between the plane z equals 1 and the plane z equals 2. And that's clearly not what's going on. So let's quickly rub that out. I hope nobody copied it down. Don't copy it down. It's wrong. It's wrong. If you copy it down, rub it out. Um, okay, so, so then what is the upper limit of z then? The upper limit of z is, is the hemisphere. Now, that's as high as, as z can go. And, and of course, mm, the hemisphere is, is at different heights depending on where you look. Sorry, that was kind of clumsily said, but somehow you need to build that into your description of z. So it's actually quite simple. What you do is you look back at the formula for z, at the formula for the hemisphere, and you simply, simply write the hemisphere equation in over there. You just have to not use x's and y's and only use r's and p's. So our hemisphere equation, or at least our sphere equation, let's have a look. Our sphere is what? Our sphere is x squared plus y squared plus z minus 1 squared equals 1. Therefore, z minus 1 squared is 1 minus x squared plus y squared, but x squared plus y squared we could also call r squared, and we're going to have to because we're dealing in cylindricals here. So z is going to be the square root of 1 minus r squared um, plus 1. Now, I could put a plus minus there, but the plus gives me my upper hemisphere and the minus will give me my lower hemisphere, and plus the upper hemisphere is the one that I'm using. So, there you go. That's the upper limit for z. Okay, so you simply get it from the sphere equation. You simply make z the subject of the sphere equation, and then you just make sure that you're only using the um, coordinate symbols that are allowed in this system, which in this case are r, theta, and z. So x's and y's need not apply. Okay, let's look at spherical. So I'm scrolling past the pictures now because of space, but I can always scroll back if you need me to. Okay, spherical. Um, spherical, we're interested in rho and theta and phi. We've already got the theta. Okay, so what about rho? Well, we'll get our rho from that picture over there, from that picture with the black detail, because I know that, well, let's have a look. Um, uh, rho is adjacent and the hypotenuse is 2. So adjacent over hypotenuse is cos of 5. So I know that my, my maximum extent of rho is 2 cos 5. What about my minimum extent? Well, that'll come from the little picture where my rho will now be my hypotenuse and my adjacent will be 1. So adjacent over hypotenuse is cos phi. So rho is 1 over cos phi, so rho is sec phi. So let me go back to green. Very similar to what we did in um, 12b and what we've already done or you'll do shortly in 13b and in fact there are some bits of 15 which you haven't got to that are also similar you're going to do that those sorts of triangles and those sorts of circles quite a lot in this course but a major geometric difference between what i'm doing here and what we did in the 2d ones is that when you're drawing your flat xy picture but with a very similar shifted circle your theta will lie between your horizontal axis and your ray. Whereas when you draw a vertical picture like that, your phi, which is always measured outward from your positive z axis, phi will actually be above your ray rather than below it. And that just makes a little subtle geometric difference. So where you had signs before, you'll have pauses now. There was a question? Okay. Okay. So. So this top one, this rho over 2 equals cos phi, comes from that big triangle that looks like this, where that's phi, and that's rho, and that's 2. Sorry, that's quite small. Can you read it? 
And then that bottom bit of black trigonometry comes from that smaller triangle, which looks like that, which has the row as the hypotenuse. So basically what I'm trying to get, so I'm going to scroll this so that it's low down on the screen so that I can reach it. <laughs> Come to Tracy Height. Come to Tracy Height. Here we go. My 10-year-old daughter is almost taller than I am. Almost, almost, almost. Definitely will be next year, but wondering if she will be by Christmas. Apparently, her uh, top of her head is at my eye line. Oh, wow. I've always known I was short. Didn't know I was short and taller than me. Here we go. So, um, I'm wanting to find the minimum. I'm um, basically, imagine, so it's, there's lots of little dots too. talking and you need to do stuff so let me get a move on so that's so that's how you get you, you just you read it off the picture you read them off the picture so you need to know your basic trigonometry you need to know your basic geometry like angle on diameter is 90 degrees um, and then after you've done a few of these they, they, they start to become fairly easy and we are, you are going to do a lot of these this sort of shifted circle thing comes up a lot okay all right what about the phi values phi goes from zero to Okay, so phi, the minimum value of phi, when the phi measures out from the positive z-axis, minimum value of phi is zero, but those will be the points that are actually on the z-axis, and then as phi goes out, 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 the maximum value of phi is pi over 4. Okay, now you might be thinking, no, no, what about minus pi over 4? Um, and I'll get to that, and I should actually have written that third, shouldn't I? Because I actually should have written theta second. Oh, well, I've written it now. Okay, the convention is to write theta second and phi third. So I'm missing a convention there a bit, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so here's the thing about phi. The minimum value of phi ever, ever, ever is zero. Phi cannot be negative. Okay? The maximum value of phi ever in any picture, in any circumstance, the maximum value of phi is pi. It can't be bigger than that. Why? Because phi measures outward from the positive z-axis. Phi doesn't care. So, okay, there's our z-axis for more of the class. Phi measures outward from the z-axis. Phi doesn't care whether it's measuring out into the first octave, or out into the passage, or out into the room next door. Phi just measures outward. So there, there is no negative direction for phi. Phi only measures outwards. And then as you go, so it starts at zero and then goes up, up, up. Thank you. 
So, there you go. All right, I think I've bored you long enough. We have seven minutes left of the period. Why don't you try and do number 17? Okay, would you like me to scroll back to the pictures or stay here on the, some, on the description? Okay, for those who care, let's have a show of hands. Who wants to stay here on the symbolic stuff? Who wants to go back to the pictures? Nobody cares. Okay, cool. Right. There we go. I'll go back to those pictures. <laughs>